Okay, special topic, additional topic here, neuro, uh, some head and neck cases. So here's a sinus case. I'll just talk briefly about sinus tumors and how to deal with them uh, in the realm of multiple choice. Now, a lot of these things look very similar, uh, you know, especially when they get big enough that you can't tell definitively where they came from. Um, so my idea or my suggestion, my thinking on this is that they have to show you some of the more characteristic features if they want you to come down hard on it. Otherwise, everything is just a squamous cell. So let's take a look at this one here. So we got a big mass here. It's expanding uh, maxillary antrum. Um, and uh, we've got an MRI. Zoom up here, and this is the characteristic feature that I'm trying to show you. See how it sort of looks like like a brain? Um, it's got what you might say is uh, white matter and, and uh, gray matter on it, sort of these cerebroform appearance. It's a buzzword. Um, so this is an inverting papilloma, and I picked three pieces of trivia that I think you need to know. The first one is the location. Now, classically, uh, it's described as the lateral nasal cavity with a relationship of the middle turbinate, middle turbinate buzzword, and maxillary ostium sort of grows through that. Um, the description buzzword that they throw around is this cerebroform pattern. I feel like they almost have to show you that and make you come down hard on this. And then the most dangerous association or the most important association to remember is that 10 to 15 percent of these things harbor a cancer. All right, next case. Again, sort of trying to demonstrate characteristic features. Uh, we've got a big mass, sort of maybe I could convince you that it has a, a dumbbell appearance like this, um, or I don't know, snowman kind of appearance. Dumbbell would be a word that I would use. It has a waist there in the middle. And then at the top, we've got these cysts, perineural cysts, they call them. So this is an esthesioneuroblastoma. Basically what that is, is it's a tumor that arises from the little nerve cells at the cribriform plate. And because of that location, they grow up and they grow down and they waste in the middle at the cribriform plate. So it looks like a dumbbell or snowman or something like that. Um, the buzzword these peritumoral cysts, those are located at the top. I almost have to show those to you. And because it has the word neuroblastoma in it, I want you to remember that it can be imaged with an MIBG scan. Next case, another big fucking mass. Okay, this one maybe is in the sphenopalatine foramen growing into the PPF, among other places. Uh, so I'm using some location buzzwords. So just a quick anatomy review. Uh, I'll take a zoom in here. This is the spinopalatine foramen here. See how it sort of connects with the pterygopalatine fossa or the PPF. Um, rotundum also showing that it, that it moves down there as well. So if you had a tumor that was just here, this would be super rare, um, you might think about a schwannoma V2, but if you have something that starts here and grows in this direction, that is your JNA. Um, starting in the spinopalatine foramen, growing into the PPF. A lot of people are like, oh, PPF. It's almost always in the PPF, but it didn't start there. It grows into there. Um, So, what do you need to know? Location, spinopalatine foramen, growing into the PPF. Classic history, this is really useful, um, especially if they would be happen to give this to you. It's a male teenager with a bloody nose. And the, the typical vascular supply, it's fed from branches of the um, external carotid. And you, you, sometimes internal maxillary, sometimes ascending pharyngeal. All right, 
right, so this one, um, I just want you to think big. Big, big, big. Big, bad, mean, angry motherfucker. This is the guy that destroys your face, right? Bony invasion this way, all the way onto the other side, growing back that way, growing everywhere, okay? So this is a snuck. It's an undifferentiated cytonasal carcinoma. Um, so it's a monster destroyer. Prognosis is terrible, as you would imagine. Um, they tend to recur a lot. They tend to met. Uh, and don't forget that, um, you know, snuck is uncommon, but squamous cells are, are common uh, in the head and neck. So just a quick anatomy review. That thing right there, um, this is normal anatomy. That is the fossa of Rosenmuller, fancy sort of French Latin sounding name. It's also an important anatomical location. So here we've got uh, a mastoid effusion. It's unilateral. Anytime you see a unilateral mastoid effusion, you need to look here next, specifically at the PPF because um, a tumor in the PPF, fossa of Rosenmuller, tumor in the fossa of Rosenmuller, you want to look in the fossa of Rosenmuller, the a tumor in the fossa of Rosenmuller is going to obstruct the eustachian tube, uh, which will result in a mastoid effusion. So there you go, sort of mass-like appearance here. And that is the most common location for nasopharyngeal cancer. Now, I'll go back to something basic here. Um, if you're ever wondering, where is the nasopharynx? Find the nose and look behind it. That's the nasopharynx. Okay, so I know head and neck anatomy is confusing depending on your background. That's my trick. Find the nose. Behind the nose is the nasopharynx. All right, so fossa of Rosenmuller. Um, it's important because it's the most common site of nasopharyngeal cancers, um, and it will block the eustachian tube and lead to an effusion, if you're lucky. So unilateral mastoid effusions, you need to look at the fossa of Rosenmuller. All right, next case. So we've got sort of dilation here of this laryngeal ventricle, seeing it on this side as well. And... Um, Basically, you have two options when you see a case like this. One is a mass, um, and one is vocal cord paralysis. So, especially if it's on the left, which we're seeing sort of dilation on the left, you will want to say, next step, look in the chest. Well, why look in the chest? So here's a quick review of anatomy. Remember, nerve comes down, wraps underneath the aortic arch, and comes back up. So if you had a mass in the AP window, be it a big lymph node or a tumor or lung cancer or whatever, that can push on that recurrent laryngeal nerve or invade it and result in paralysis on that side. So um, bottom line, next step, look in the AP, look at the look in the chest. All right, here's sort of the companion case. Again, sort of dilation on this side. But then this is the situation where we have big fucking mass over here, right? So it's a, on the other side, there's a big tumor, uh, and then you're seeing that effect on that side too. So um, you'll hear laryngeal cancer descriptions basically in three or four terms. People say uh, subglottic, glottic, um, uh, supraglottic, and then um, transglottic. Uh, for, for really aggressive, if you hear the transglottic, that means it's super mean and super aggressive, like uh, basically a really high-grade malignancy or an infection or uh, some kind of um, congenital malformation that sort of showed up before the, the fascial planes were in place. Um, but if you're going to pick one, glottic has the least lymphatic drainage, um, and supposedly is, it's going to do the best. All right, so um, what side is the problem on? If you know it's paralysis or if you know it's cancer. So um, 
dilated on this side means the problem's on this side if it's paralysis. Dilated on this side means the problem's on that side if it's cancer. And you can see how that could be potentially testable. All right, next case. So axial, sagittal, I've got a fluid collection here. Now before you jump and you call it infection, pause for a second, I want you to pause for a second, and then I want you to look really close in front of C1, C2 to make sure you're not seeing any kind of amorphous um, mineralized density. Uh, because if you do, you may be dealing with acute calcific tendonitis that's the location you see it at. It's hydroxyapatite, and uh, it can cause an acute inflammatory process. It can mimic uh, an infection, and it's pretty much always at that location right there at the superior longus coli. All right, next case, another one, sort of ant mini uh, look here. So that thing, big, it's too big, it's too much. So this is your elong elongated styloid process, uh, and it can be associated with um, it can be associated with some discomfort. Um, it's classically described as occurring after a tonsillectomy. Um, now, why after a tonsillectomy? Uh, because sort of your normal anatomy is shifted in there after the after the tonsil is taken out. Um, it can push on nerves, it can push on vet, vet, um, vessels. The, the thing is that a lot of people have elongated styloid processes, and you look really dumb if you're just, say, query eagle syndrome every time you see an elongated styloid process. Uh, but in a setting where somebody has symptoms and they're looking for a cause, if you see that, it can be the cause. Um, and the gamesmanship here is that instead of showing you that coronal where it's very obvious or that sagittal where it's very obvious, you can show it in an axial plane where it's going down too far. And that's how they get tricked. So, um, all right, next case, we've got a cystic looking thing and the floor of the mouth. And I'm giving you a hint that it's fat suppressed. So if there's fat in a mass, then you think teratoma or dermoid, something like that, right? So this is a floor of the mouth dermoid. They do exist. Um, dermoids like to occur at midline structures, like where things come together. Um, although in the head and neck, it's typically around the lateral portion of the orbit. They have to show you fat to make you call it a dermoid. They have to. And sometimes it's a bunch of little tiny balls of fat, uh, or sometimes it's a big fat. Thing. They'll show you an MR with fat saturation or something to make you, you know, it's very, very low density on CT or something where you can say that's got fat in it. They have to tell you. So let's look and compare three cystic masses in and around the, the head and neck here. Um, there's this one, that one, that one. Okay, so this one that's sort of coming off to the side, notice that it's sort of got this... Um, uh, sort of triangle-ish looking shape like that. This is a ranula, plunging ranula when it's underneath the myohyoid muscle. Um, it's basically a mucus retention cyst. This right here, it, at the bottom part of the tongue, the base of the tongue, remember there's this entity that foramen cecum, you know, where you've got this embryological pathway of your thyroid that goes all the way down. This is a thyroglossal duct cyst will be midline and sort of that location. Um, and then lastly, we've got something that's lateral here. This is your brachial cleft cyst, usually a type two. Be careful calling it that um, in older people, maybe a necrotic lymph node. And if it is a necrotic lymph node, you should look at the floor of the mouth. Remember HPV, you can still get cancers like in your 20s and stuff like that. That's a thing that happens. All right, so uh, that's it for this. Moving on.